be. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today talking to you about the human speech production. Uh, so as I'm talking right now and articulating, I'm actually suppressing my auditory cortex while I hear the reafferent speech. Uh, this auditory cortex suppression has been well described across the animal kingdom, across different modalities um, of recording. So here on the bottom, you see um, intracellular recordings in rodents uh, with acoustic output after self-generated action. Uh, true for LFP and human Utah rays, human intracranial and uh, scalp EEG also all show um, auditory cortex suppression. So the idea that the suppression during self-generated uh, vocalization or action is uh, happening due to a motor cortex or motor structure signal sending uh, information about the impending acoustic uh, consequence of movement. <clears throat> so in general, this is called a corollary discharge, and this is ubiquitous across the animal kingdom uh, throughout multiple modalities. A good example of this is a cricket. So the cricket makes these very loud chirps by moving its wings. But the chirps are so loud that if you play it back to the cricket, it deafens them. And they can't uh, uh, be attuned to their acoustic surroundings. So the biological system has a, uh, has a motor neuron. I actually can't see the uh, pointer. So it has a motor neuron that innervates the wings and moves them. And there's an interneuron that suppresses the auditory neuron in phase. So every time you move, the cricket moves its wings, it actually suppresses the auditory neuron, thereby allowing uh, processing of um, non sharp related acoustic stimuli. So of course, all of us here are, are not crickets, and we're not filtering out chirps. Um, however, in human EEG recordings, um, when um, neurotypicals listen to a, a vocalization like an E, there's a very robust N1 auditory component in the EEG. And that component is suppressed here, seen in blue, uh, when they produce the same vowels. Interestingly, with uh, patients who have schizophrenia, you don't see this uh, typical suppression of auditory cortex. So there's a, a wide theory that there's, um, um, their, their coily discharge circuit is not intact. And perhaps the fact that they don't have the suppression, this, the correct signaling, um, leads to uh, uh, inability to dissociate internal, internal um, generated um, signals versus external generated ones. And that may lead in part to positive symptoms such as auditory hallucination. So although the auditory suppression side uh, in primates uh, has been extremely well described, uh, the source of this motor signal um, is really unknown. So different speech models theorize that it's coming from motor cortex or inferior frontal gyrus or premotor or SMA, but there's no real tangible evidence of a source of the signal. Oh, the only uh, robust evidence is for the suppression uh, downstream of auditory cortex. Okay, so we're tackling this question to try to um, look for this source using intracranial recordings. These are patients with refractory epilepsy undergoing, undergoing neurosurgical treatment for their epilepsy, where they need to have a grid of electrodes and um, um, depth EEG electrodes in and on their brain to monitor epileptic foci. Uh, while they're in the hospital for around a one week period, we work with them and if they consent, we run uh, different cognitive tasks. Um, so uh, the cognitive task we're going to be looking at now is a very simple auditory word repetition task. So they hear the word balloon and they say balloon, for example, in one trial. So um, as part of the CRCNS grant, one of our aims was to develop uh, uh, techniques to look at information flow and connectivity. So the um, signal, uh, target signal of interest is called the high gamma band. So this is 70 or high gamma broadband, 70 to 150 hertz. Uh, it has been used for the past 20 years as a, a local um, index of cortical activity. It correlates with underlying spiking activity and as well as the underlying uh, bold activity. Extremely robust across trials. So the first stage of our pipeline is we, we extract the, the neural signals in this band. Um, and we automatically detect active channels. But we want to go beyond just local activity. We want to look at connectivity. 
So our approach is um, using a, a form of um, autoregressive techniques. Um, so we're trying to um, operationalize information flow by predicting future samples in one electrode from the, the past of other electrodes in the same electrode. So this is similar to grandeur causality or directed coherence. Um, another issue is that when you look at coherence or directed coherence, uh, you have directionality, you have the arrows, but uh, if one and two and three here in the figure are correlated, you're going to think one and three are correlated or three and four, even though, uh, the, even though those are spurious connections. You want to partial them out. So we partial it out like a partial regression. We use partial directed coherence. So this is all implemented using an autoregressive technique in the frequency domain. We partial out uh, all the information uh, that we acquire from the electrodes. Uh, and this gives us uh, many, many electrode by electrode connectivity or information flow matrices, and we run this, we repeat this process across time. But that's a huge amount of information. Uh, and uh, previously, people, uh, myself included, have focused on region of interest in, um, approaches, um, but we really wanted to see what uh, patterns are in the data. So we uh, use an unsupervised approach. Uh, in this case, it's a non-negative matrix factorization uh, with an orthogon orthogonality constraint. So what that does, it takes this huge connectivity matrices and it breaks them down to smaller matrices um, using a lower dimension, in our case, three or four prototypical uh, abundant uh, connectivity profile. So we get one connectivity profile on the bottom that shows us the temporal progression of that profile, and the other is the weights on cortex. So information going from one area, source in red, to a target area in blue. Um, so what, I show, what I'm showing you on the top here is the average activity across different words in the auditory word repetition task. So first, locked at onset in zero, you hear the word balloon. Uh, within uh, in the x-axis, you see milliseconds. So there's a, a, a spatial uh, temporal um, evolution with a lot of uh, activity in red, uh, marking change, uh, percent change from baseline in STG or auditory cortex. So we're hearing something, and STG is online, so that makes sense. But we have all these other areas, uh, premotor, IFG, a ventral motor that, that are coming online as well. And we want to move from local activity to um, connectivity. So we apply our uh, partial directed coherence and then uh, unsupervised clustering, and we get three major um, prototypes. So the first prototype, uh, you see the significant um, um, information flow in blue around peaking around 100 milliseconds with information flow from STG, auditory cortex, onto motor cortex and IFG. Uh, the next prototype peaks a bit later, um, but we now have uh, also information going from uh, IFG onto um, uh, precentral gyrus, uh, and that's been reported before. What was uh, surprising, uh, to me at least, is as we approach articulation, so on the bottom in the, the violin black plot, you see distribution of reaction times. Uh, the, this third component really shifts with information from motor cortex onto STG. When I first saw this, I got very excited because this really looked like something that uh, looked like a quarterly discharge. So it kind of quacks like a duck. But does it walk like a duck? So uh, first of all, we had to verify that, you know, when this is happening because you would assume that a quarterly discharge from, from a motor structure would happen prior to uh, the um, articulation um, and uh, acoustic feedback. So we lock to articulation onset here in zero. So on top, again, you see the local uh, neural activity and the bottom uh, are clustering. So we first um, replicate this more perceptual uh, type of connectivity profile with STG and IFG going onto motor cortex. But then we replicate the quarry discharge from motor cortex onto STG with peak timing around negative 100 where you expect it prior to articulation onset and more information flow um, following uh, during articulation. Okay, so maybe it walks like a duck, but this may be an artifact of our, our task, right? So this is auditory word repetition. Is this a corollary discharge or is it information flow that's uh, just due to the task? So we use a battery of tasks that we use uh, clinically uh, at our site, which includes auditory word repetition. Balloon. When you say balloon, but across different tasks, we have the same word target with a different lexical route of retrieval. So in this case, you're going to now uh, visual word reading. So you read balloon and you say it, and we get a very similar pattern. You see the balloon and you name it. You hear a description. A rubber object that you inflate with helium. You complete a sentence. The clown inflated the... 
And across all of these, we really were able to replicate the same prototype in terms of timing and overall distribution from uh, motor onto STG. Okay, but the question really is, you know, to call it a core discharge, it has to be connected to actual suppression. It could still be a cortical information flow. So we had to quantify the degree of suppression. So we take the average activity during hearing the word uh, balloon versus saying the word balloon, and we create a normalized index from negative one to one, where one is highly uh, suppressed and negative one is actually enhanced during speech. And I'm plotting below all the electrodes across the participants and their distribution across cortex. So you see there's a wide spatial distribution. But the key, qu key question is, are, are electrodes are showing more suppression? Are they getting more information? So we have this prototype, uh, and I'm showing you the overall distribution of uh, um, inflow and outflow. But for every electrode in STG, we have the degree of information inflow it gets from our connectivity matrices. So now for every electrode, we have both the degree of suppression and the degree of information it's getting from this prototype in motor cortex. And the question is, uh, is there um, uh, a predictive or uh, correlation? And indeed, we find a very robust uh, correlation between the two. Um, so finally, uh, this inflow can happen from many different sources across our prototype and may be changing across time. So we wanted to verify the timing. So we limited this to uh, the, the peak information flow from ventral motor cortex, uh, and we repeated this correlation analysis across time. So we took uh, inflows at different time points and asked when the connectivity, uh, when the correlation is peaking. And when you do this analysis, you find we kind of replicate this negative 100 timing where at the negative 100, we get the peak correlation between the inflow at that time point to the subsequent um, suppression that happens during articulation. Uh, and in the blue lines, you see individual uh, patient profiles of correlations. Okay, so uh, for in summary, uh, we created as part of this uh, uh, grant a, uh, um, a a pipeline to get prototypical cortical information flow across cortex, which we will publish and uh, share with the community so you can use in different human electrophysiological techniques, uh, both invasive and non-invasive. Um, I think we provide robust evidence for the source of cortical discharge in, uh, in human speech and ventral motor cortex, uh, and that the timing um, uh, is uh, prior to speech and correlates robustly with the degree of suppression. Uh, so this is a CRCNS grant uh, from my lab in collaboration with the um, main PI, Yao Wang, in natural engineering, where we work together to create these new um, uh, techniques to analyze our data. It was led by Amir Khalilian, who is a co-advised PhD student and a postdoc in the lab now, and we couldn't do this work without the clinicians and neurosurgeons um, listed here below. So thank you very much, and I'm open to questions. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. I'm, I'm curious about whether or not suppression really does occur in all cases, though, uh, in human speech or, let's say, in singing. So when someone's performing, they want to be able to monitor their voice, so suppression may not be such a good idea. So have you thought about whether or not you can explore the possibility that um, this suppression might be reduced or even eliminated or be selective, depending upon the context of, of vocal production? All right, that's a great question. Let me start by saying not all of STG or auditory cortex is suppressed. So some areas are more suppressed than others. And if you looked at the distribution, there's actually some areas that are enhanced or specific and following your own vocalizations. Um, another um, item to consider is one of the reasons there's suppression is for when you're paying attention to your feedback and there's a mistake or you heard something that is uh, not in line with your expectation, then there's an increase in signal, so kind of an error signal. So it's not suppressed to a level of shutting down. It's actually attenuated such that you can pay more attention to the environment and get a, a, a boost of signal when there's, when there's, an, when there's an error. Now, I haven't looked at singing per se. It's, uh, we actually have some data uh, that, that is run clinically, so it would be interesting um, to analyze that. My prediction would be, given that this is such so robust, uh, both in humans and across many different animals, my prediction would be that you'd still get overall suppression. Um, and maybe when you're off tune, you'd get an error signal there. Uh, but I don't think that when you change the context from speech to singing, uh, you wouldn't get uh, suppression. But 
that's an empirical question that needs to be answered. Michal? That is a great question. Uh, we, we do see kind of a parallel uh, with uh, slightly more asymmetry to the left. However, we, we kept it out of the paper. The reason being is we don't have good bilateral coverage. So this is the main issue with ECOG. If you have grid, it's going to be one hemisphere. Stereo, you have bilateral, but you don't have good sampling. So given we, we couldn't rule out that the connectivity isn't driven across hemispheres. So it's really hard to ascertain if the differences, which were stronger on the left versus on the right, were due to kind of interhemispheric connections we don't sample. Thank you very much.